We're at Mobile World Congress 2019 here in Barcelona, and I'm joined by Jonas Axen. Hi, Jonas, how are you? Hey, Des, I'm fantastic. Thanks for making time to catch up with me. Of course. Now, Jonas is the uh, head of automation AI for Ericsson Managed Services, and that's an amazing challenge you've taken on there. And we'll get into that a little bit more. But before we do, um, maybe could you just give us a quick overview of what's on the floor here at Mobile World Congress 2019 from your team on the pavilion? Yes. So let me start off. I'm super happy to be here. Uh, I think uh, we all feel now the, the positive momentum in our industry, and it's very much uh, visible on the floor as well. Right. Of course, uh, 5G is the thing and now it's happening. It's real. It's really happening, right? Well, you got 10 customers signed uh, that Absolutely. are named. You got uh, uh, 42 that are under NDA currently, but about to come public, and thousands more that are, have got expressions of interest for us, Dan, so that's phenomenal. <laughs> exactly, and we see the whole end-to-end -end is also coming. It's not only on the network side, but also the handset, uh, the right. band, uh, the chipsets are coming, the whole, everything is lining up. That's super exciting for me, actually. No, I can imagine. Yes. Well, the thing I keep hearing this week is that, uh, effectively, that. 5G is real, it's happening. You know, we, we, we thought it was sort of George Jetson science fiction in the future, maybe last year, but now it's yeah. real, it's here, people are using it, they're deploying yeah. it, which I think is very exciting. Yes, and, now, and, and the use cases are coming as well, right? Yes, exactly. So, so the number of use cases are kind of exploding. We start to see use cases now in, you know, factor one to five than right. we saw before, right? So right. That's, uh, incredible. Now, you've got some exciting news. The Ericsson Operations Engine. Uh, exciting launch, exciting announcement. Um, Two things. Firstly, uh, maybe just explain for viewers who have heard about it but haven't really had a chance to sort of deep dive and understand it. Could you just explain it at the high level? What is the Ericsson uh, operations engine and what's its function? What does it do? Absolutely. So we, we basically come towards the operations engine saying that we are now moving from a reactive type of operations to becoming much more proactive operations. Right. And we're taking an end-to-end -end view on this one. And we see more and more that managed services is becoming much more an end-to-end -end story. We're getting more intelligence into the products themselves, yep. but someone really needs to make sure that we get the end-to-end -end on how everything is uh, connected, sure. basically. Yep. And that's where we start with uh, our operations engine. It's a new pro blueprint, it's a new offering. The thing that strikes me with all the things I'm hearing about this uh, year at Mobile World Congress 2019 from Ericsson is this end-to-end -end component. So you know, you're not just solving individual bespoke things. Uh, you're creating open standards, open compliance yes. to the platforms. They're cloud native. They're on you know Docker and Kubernetes and OpenStack. But they do that whole end-to-end. -end. So from professional services consulting through to the actual implementation and almost self-service in many ways. Right. Um, that seems to be a big theme. Is that a fair thing to say? I fully agree. Right. And we also see that yes, as we take the bigger approach on this one of course there is complexity to manage in this one right right so even though that we say maybe we are moving towards a technology that will, by itself will have less complication within it but the complexity of managing the end-to-end -end is definitely here and that's what we are basically attacking now the other thing that uh, strikes me uh, looking at what's happening around the world at this whole space is this I guess the size and speed and scale right yes. once upon a time people would run around and put RJ45 plugs into little switches and routers and we could put things on poles and wires. Nowadays we're talking about software-defined infrastructure, software-defined yes. networking, yes. Uh, everything's virtualized and yes. I guess now this is really where the operations engine comes into play because well, we can sort of automate and orchestrate some of this stuff, do that fail and fail fast component we've seen in a lot of startups and the unicorns and even enterprise but not traditionally telco previously but no. this is kind of is this where we're at now? I, I definitely, yes absolutely and we also see that as all of this is moving in uh, automation is critical to yep. make it happen yep. and that's you know automation combined with AI and all the learnings we have and we have plugged it into the blueprint of our offering basically and, and that you, you're fully correct the speed it yeah, needs to happen it's, here, it's too big. but at the same time, you know, the focus on customer experience, the focus on network and service quality, the focus on efficiency, right. cost pressure is definitely here. Uh, all of this combined, so yeah. you kind of... Well, carriers and operators traditionally have been under a great deal of pressure because they have big sunk costs for sort of 10 or 15 year investments. They've got to get an ROI at various stages. Yes. To me, it now seems that, that you've got reduced time to market, reduced cost of infrastructure because it's virtualized, it's software. Yes. And so now you've got to reduce time to sort of develop new services, new capabilities, but that whole sort of, you know, time to market and ROI becomes much shorter. I, yes. I know, um, uh, talking to a number of your team in the last sort of 12, 13 months, you've gone from months to sort of weeks to hours and now minutes to instantiate yes. environments. And also that uh, continuous, uh, I guess, uh, you know, uh, DevOps uh, approach of uh, agile development, agile Correct. testing, create yes. an idea, create a product, deploy it, test it, and keep iterating. So yes. continuous development, continuous improvement, is that right? Yeah, that is definitely right, right. And also what, what we try to achieve then with Operations Engine is to, one thing is the technology per se, 
But honestly, in many areas, we are being challenged on the change management. Right. So we're getting caught on you know ways of working, processes, competences, and that might be one of the biggest uh, blockers at the moment okay. for many of us to move quicker. Yeah. Uh, and that's what really what we approached also in, in this new offering. So you know, focus on the change management. Make sure that we review all the processes that we've been having. Yeah. Are they valid for the future? Yes or no? What are the competences? What, how does the pyramids look like? How do we do this on global scale? Right. That's well, that's the big challenge, isn't yes. it? And I guess that comes with a whole range of, uh, of, of corporate-wide and, and organization-wide for the operators of the telcos of cultural shift and behavioral shift around getting used to, uh, you know, once upon a time changing things created risk and broke things. Nowadays, we want to change them quickly and respond to them. Yes. With this in mind, uh, we talk a lot about artificial intelligence, yes. and it's a very broad topic. But really, in this case, we're talking about machine learning, aren't we? We're not talking about yeah. deep learning and sort of sentience. We're talking about machine learning, building models, looking for patterns, responding to them. And one of the things you said uh, previously was that really struck a chord with me, and that is that predictive component, right? So we're not, not doing break, fix, reactive. We're doing pr predictive analysis, looking for where things are going to break, and self-healing, which is where, I guess, things like Cenex, the acquisition of Cenex, and, yes. and also what Neil Lilly's team with the uh, Service Assurance was originally doing, yeah. that now you can see things breaking, respond to it. Tell us a little bit more about where AI plays in to that whole game with the Ericsson Operations Engine. Absolutely. So, so if we take it from a complexity angle, then, of course, there's a great number of opportunities, but we, we need to manage the complexity. Right. And then we say, okay, how do we do this in the best manner going forward? Forward. We have a reactive type of uh, setup in the past. Yep. Now we go from a data-driven, proactive operations. Right. That's what we're doing. In order to do, be really proactive and preemptive, AI is the technology. Mm -hmm. and, and just like you rightfully said, the big sub-technology on AI, which is really rolling into uh, telecom, is machine learning. Yes. Yep. Fairly, you know, pattern recognition type, getting uh, proactive, identify, you know, I you can start to see things yes. well in advance, yeah, yeah. all the way up to 24 hours in advance. And that's really happening. And we, we kind of, internally, we, we kind of see it as the, the hidden hero. Okay. It will work behind the scene. I like that. Yeah. Us as end users, we might not see it, yeah, yeah. but we will see much better customer you know, use experience. We'll see uh, mission critical um, functionality never yeah. going down, yeah. et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. And the other thing that I'm really keen on understanding uh, with regard to what Operations Engine offers is there's a shift now from that centralized data center model to some of the edge computing, edge networking. Yes. Um, tell me a little bit more about how that fits into what the Ericsson Operations Engine can do at the moment and where it's going. I mean, I think yes. you know, we've, we've got a lot of smartphones on the edge of the network and a lot of intelligence there, but we've got you know autonomous things, little yes. little things delivering pizzas to yes. you know big trains. We, yes. uh, Rio Tinto in Australia just had a train go across the country all by itself, right? Yeah. Massive train full of coal or whatever. Yeah. Um, a lot of that data's traditionally moved to a centralized location, it seems to me now that what you're doing is moving it to the edge of the network where the data is and put yep. the intelligence and the analytics there. Yes. Where does that fit in with what you're doing with the operations engine? Absolutely. So, so again, we, we kind of, uh, we see, we take it from the end to end. Right. So we, we're basically uh, built a model now where we can go all the way from the new use case, yep. call it mission critical. We go into an, an edge data center, we go into a, a national, regional, or even global data center. Right. And we do this end to end. So we're actually moving from the traditional networking, the radio, mm -hmm. into the data center, more traditional IT maybe. And then we apply also design and optimization on top of this. And that's where basically the whole operations engine is, is focused today. And we have some uh, very fantastic uh, use cases on the floor today. Well, actually, I had a question about that. I mean, yeah. uh, thinking about this, I mean, it's a very big, exciting topic. Um, but can you give us a couple of examples of some of the typical use cases you've applied it to currently? Because, yep. I mean, we could talk all day about yes. the <laughs> potential use cases, but yep. what have you done so far, with and, yep. and, and what can people sort of drink, glean Ab from that? Absolutely. So if I take one step back before I do that, yeah, it's please basically do. saying, okay, what has been our main objective now as we focus very much on change management yep. and what the new AI technologies actually enables us to do. So we said we really need to make sure that we are now not creating a separate fancy AI functional side. Right. This needs to be tightly embedded into our line. So we are basically boosting our line with data SME. Okay. And we're making sure that data SMEs work with our domain expertise yep. and the system. That's you know right. So like a holistic view to the the problem solving components. They're exactly. not just band-aiding little things. 360 by 360. Yes, but also make sure yeah. that one of the key assets we have is the domain expertise. Right. So just applying data SME and machine learning and uh, machine learning platforms, it will take us a certain way. 
but it's domain expertise. Okay. So we basically embrace these technologies, enhance what we do, and therefore we get out um, many, many use cases where we have trained the models based on domain expertise. Right, right. We do co-creation with customers. Fantastic. We trial it. We actually have contracted now, so it's rolling into production. Oh, wow. And you will see use cases like uh, identifying proactively sleeping cells in the networks. Right, that's a big problem. Yeah. You will find KPI degradation, both in the radio and in the core. Uh, you will find uh, anomaly detection, but more advanced. So it's actually a digital twin. Okay. So we create digital twins of a nationwide network, and we constantly ping the real network, yeah, which yeah. is the digital twin, and very, very successfully start identifying things. Fantastic. That, uh, you know, we would never have seen before. Right. Yeah. So just, uh, just uh, some examples. Awesome. I, I did read something uh, earlier on, and I had a conversation with the other colleagues yesterday around this whole idea, and I think it was in the Middle East somewhere, uh, where they, they applied some of this to uh, what's happening in, in a particular carrier, I won't name them, yep. and you found up to 2% yes. of their cells were sleeping. Yes. And we won't go into why, but you were able to then address it, resolve it, and I imagine that's millions of dollars worth of business yes. opportunity back, and service level quality and assurance for the consumers as well, because yes. now I can get a better level of service and connection. Yeah, absolutely. And you can imagine, right, if, let's say you have a network, you invest a lot of money in your network. Yes. You want to make sure you get every single dollar out of the network. Right? Absolutely. And here you have sites where all lights are green. Right. You can imagine what type of strain that puts on operations to do root cause analysis, you know, find the yeah, where yeah. is the problem really. Uh, and th this is where you know we, we deployed, we got the, the statistics out and we actually fixed everything. And, and we actually seen a couple of other customers uh, around the globe that had a higher percentage than the one we just mentioned. Wow, Yes. that's exciting. Yes. Well, the other thing, I mean, we won't go into too much detail, but the other thing that strikes me with this um, is that it's a safety thing as well, because if you don't have to send as many people out in the field in vans, they're not on the road, you reduce the human risk as well. Absolutely. So you've got a business and commercial and financial incentive from a technology point of view, yes. but you've also got uh, you know people who want to work for the company more because they're less at risk in the field, right? You're spot on. I Big mean, plus. Look, if you look at the OHS problems yeah. that many uh, of us have, it's traffic exactly. incidents or yeah, yeah. So another use case we have is actually we can predict the need of dispatching someone to the field. Wow. So, so even though our network operation centers, uh, you know, they have not really successfully solved the problem, they trigger someone to go out, yep. we still apply AI to really see is this needed or not. We can yep. predict now. So one uh, big, big operator that we deployed this one for, they had almost 10% of all dispatching was no fault found. Wow. And thanks to the AI, we can predict now that 90% of that is not needed. We just stop the work for it. It doesn't have to trigger the, the feed. Gosh. And then we say, okay, let's say, let, let's follow a logical tree. Let's say like this, that we have the dispatching prediction, and prediction says, ah, you still need to send someone out. Mm -hmm. Okay, what is the next costly step? Right. Does someone need to climb a tower or not? Yeah. yeah now yeah. we're applying an AI to predict, do I need to climb? Okay. And then the next step after that is, okay, when I climb, since we are a multi-vendor, what type of tooling do I need? There's a lot of flow on benefits, right? It's, uh, you know, it's bottom line exciting. impact immediately. Well, I would certainly feel a lot happier if I was being sent to the right place at the right time to fix the right thing rather than that constant frustration of getting there and finding it's the yes. wrong tower, the wrong antenna. Yes. You mentioned something that was very, uh, uh, a trigger a question, collaboration. Yeah. Right. So we hear a lot of this whole co-compete collaboration. Uh, I was in New York with the OSS BSS user group uh, event recently and they had like 61 carriers under one roof all talking about how they're going to work together, yeah. share information, share data. Now that, I, I had never seen that before. They're always yeah. trying to kill each other, right? Um, where does collaboration play in this whole challenge of what you're doing with the Ericsson Operations Engine? It's, it's a big topic. Yeah. Give me a summary of kind of where collaboration fits into the story. Yeah. So I, I, I come from a little bit from the automation AI angle then, of course, right? Yes, of course. Uh, and uh, we, we kind of say that we have two different media collaboration areas. One is, of course, internally. Right. Yeah. Uh, so we have a good uh, working relationship now with Ericsson Research. We have a, an AI boosting organization. Okay. Really make sure that we have delivery capability and forward planning, right? But most importantly is the customer dimension. Right. So we're running co-creation workshops, we are uh, creating use cases together, uh, and everyone is super eager to make this happen, right? Not only because, yes, AI is uh, very popular. Sure. Uh, but we also start to see very tangible things. Yeah, yeah. And yes, there are th things in the radio, but honestly, it's equally much in the transmission in the core, because everyone is, you know, we want to deploy the AI for the end to end. Mm -hmm. And so we sit down with many, many customers. Uh, we basically say that this is the capability we have within, in our library already. Right. We say, no, these use cases interesting. 
or what else is interesting? And then we say, Perfect. you know, we need their insight of their own network, their own reality. We apply our domain expertise and we boost it with AI. Uh, I love that. Now, I've seen that in a number of other industries and, I, and I'm excited to see telcos doing this now where, as you said, you've got collaboration internally. Yep. So now you've got multiple teams that are probably sharing anything from code base and models yes. through to data sets. Yes. Uh, master data management is a sort of a more 360 degree view of the world holistically. Yep. Uh, so you know you're getting broader insights and, and more longitudinal data sets working with historically and whatever. Yep. Um, but overlaying that with the, the market and the industry and the, the, con the consumer side with the customers uh, and your partners, I think, is just going to balloon that yes. beyond, I guess, the imagination is the only limiting factor then, right? Yes. So what problem can I solve? Yeah. And I guess the next step is then uh, solve service to a point, uh, which we've seen with a lot of um, citizen data science yes. uh, using the right tools to make things where they're not necessarily a data scientist or an analyst, they look at the right tools to it. Correct. But, but also agree. And one reflection I also have in, as part of these dialogues and the collaboration we have with customers is that very often the whole, uh, what I call the, the previous type of discussions on you know cost plus, yep. efficiency, 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 kind of, uh, it's not that focused anymore. Right. We are generating value together. It's highly advanced gotcha. type of services being created now, which also allows us to move up and have the, the business outcome dialogue. Further up the food chain almost, Much the value up, chain, as we say. Which is interest of us, yes. but also uh, from the operators, we believe. Well, I do like that phrase. I actually had a t-shirt once, uh, try and move up the value chain. Yeah. Um, but I, I, I genuinely do believe that if you can create value, revenue invariably follows value because people are willing to pay for that, right? Yes. Now, we're at Mobile World Congress 2019 here in Barcelona, an amazing pavilion, amazing show, and congratulations. Uh, one last question for you. Yes. After the show and all the glitz is done, uh, what's next? Where does it go? Um, what are the big steps you're going forward? And, and more importantly, how do people engage with you? Um, because I think there's a question that comes up regularly, and that is, what's the best time to reach out to the Ericsson team, and particularly yeah. the team uh, uh, that are working on the Ericsson uh, operations engine with Zelf under managed services? Uh, do they do it early in the conversation? Do they do it midway at the end? My gut feeling is the sooner the better. Yes, um, absolutely. But I'd love your take on it. No, absolutely. So, uh, of course, there's been a lot of uh, planning and preparation for, uh, for Barcelona, of course. Of course. And uh, internally, what is happening is that we are now taking what is being presented here is being rolled out towards all the customer accounts. Right. So they get access to it. Uh, you get the customer getting a touch and feel of what's going on. Yep. And like, just like you said, the, the, the quicker the better. Uh, yeah. Because uh, the demand was also extremely high. Okay. Yeah. There you go. And the interest is extremely high. Uh, so of course, uh, uh, we will do our best to fulfill the demand as quickly as possible. Indeed. And I, I guess the thing for me, uh, just to wrap up, is that. Um, the sooner this conversation starts with you and, and some of the partners, the more pitfalls, the more risks, the more things that you can share with them that you've already gleaned and learned from your existing work. So they don't yeah. have to learn the hard way. You can yes. share those insights with them and that saves Absolutely. time and effort and cost and resource and whatever. Yes. Um, well, it all sounds amazing and I can't wait to get my hands on on the floor here and congratulations again on a fantastic show. Uh, look, to me, I think Mobile World Congress 2019 is yet another exciting, fantastic success story for you already and I'm only experiencing day one. Yeah. Thank you so much, Des. Well, Jonas, thank you so much for catching up with me on camera. It's great to see you again, and um, we'll look forward to seeing what's on the floor and what's coming up from you and your team the next uh, 12 to 18 months. Perfect. Congratulations. Thanks thank very much. much. Thank Cheers. you.